Oh. Oh. What's the image over there? Not that image, that one. The preview or in it in the normal. Okay. As long as it stays normal, as long as that one stays normal. This one can be flipped, it shouldn't matter because this is, that one's more. Yes, but the preview on that camera's got back to like the live stream is what's flipping it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> and then this is why, dare I say, who are the million veterans? Um, but is that, what is it, right? As much as I want to believe that the metaverse is the silver server, right, in the general city, this is what I thought when I Google image search, metaverse. Um, this is not what I think it is. This is what I thought it was in the early 90s, right? This is not the same. So I'm going to with a little mental exercise for you to think about how you would define it. We're going to play a little game for you to kind of get to your own metaverse. This or that metaverse. So I'm going to give you a couple options in a couple of like, seconds to think about where you land when it comes to these different characteristics that you find. So, first up, this or that. Is the metaverse one thing or is it a lot of things? Is it the metaverse or is it multiple metaverse? 
running into my door. This one that was the function. Is it primarily for fun and game? Or the normal thing for I mean, we can pull stills out of the video. I think the whole point is that look at this. How does it exist? The persistent texture. Oh, yeah. Or is it more complicated? That she isn't enough in training. In this case, it's not a good thing. Yeah, I can't. 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 Yeah, I am more comfortable working with mine. But okay, then go get yours. This, I'll I'll just, just, yeah, you yeah. I'll sit over here and just watch it. So I think my team, right, this is the team I would get from many places, multi-purpose, consistent, and I'm going to be hard. Now, of course, your team, we think we're okay, because we're all still trying to figure it out. But in order to have this conversation for the next four years, I'm going to build from this my definition and create kind of a comprehensive idea of how we would define the metaverse, which would be in this a persistent virtual world that exists, even though you're not actively engaged in it. It's a space where you can engage in the same daily activities you would in a Let's see if someone texted you and it popped up on your back saying that I'm going to grab like formal pictures because this isn't really zoomed in on her. It's not really zoomed in on her. Shane. Other side. Because as I said before, gaming spaces are the closest thing we have to metaverse like spaces. Uh, and if we think about the time that we spend in digital gaming spaces, if you recall, most of us agree that the days look like this. 
and effectiveness and moderation, and there's a normalization of hate and harassment, there is a rise of extremist behavior, all of which we're going to talk about today, in between the fun of creating and playing and what we do in So this is what I want to talk about today. How can we address this better so we can stop barreling towards this, which is just insane, just more and more so. I mean, I don't want that. I don't think anybody really wants that. So how are we going to avoid it? So we established we have metaverse like spaces of today. So let's look at those. Are those safe? Are those spaces safe? And I know that we already determined that metaverse like spaces are multifunctional, but for the rest of the discussion, I'm going to largely focus on my one corner of it, which are being specifically for a few reasons. One, it's a part of the metaverse I'm most invested in not being an upstream buyer. Uh, and two, because as I mentioned before, I do think games fit the most um, closely the definition of the metaverse that I mentioned to earlier. So they're a great case study to move forward. Think about what do we have, what's our situation now, how do we fix it? If we don't fix it now, what chance do we have when we start moving towards spaces that have higher visual and behavioral fidelity or ready player one situations? So first we're going to talk about if it's safe, we have to kind of scope out the problem. And this is one of my favorite quotes um, from the book, The Toxic Mediocrity of New Game Culture, uh, and why gaming culture is the worst to fight Chris Paul. It's a great book. And his quote is, um, although the world is full of jerks and the internet is full of jerks, one can certainly make a strong argument that some of the jerkiest are floating around um, video games, circulating around video games. A few paragraphs later, he continues, the common discourse and actions that have become normal, routine, and part of the video game environment, part of the environment of video games, is troubling. And if you look at the research, it really, really is. Um, this is looking at some of my own work, looking at the prevalence of what I call dark participation in gaming spaces. And here we found disruptive behavior of all kinds. Blue is directly targeted, directly experienced, or is witnessed. It's trash talking, you know, verbal spamming, griefing. They're all more the norm than the exception. They're normalized. We also see it with more extreme forms, sexual harassment, hate speech, and violent threats. Again, experienced in blue and in orange is witnessed. In many cases, they are the norm and not the exception. Here's some new data from a project we're doing actually right now, looking at dark participation, dark participation in extremism, and we ask, do you think toxic behavior has become a culturally justified and normalized experience in games? 80% said yes. And it's the same question specifically in regards to hateful behavior, and 70% said yes. They are culturally justified, they are normalized, they are embedded in this space, we're just kind of accepting it, is that's the way it is, and that's experiencing. So are these spaces safe? No, <laughs> I would say they're not. Um, although it is important to note that this work is referring to things that are primarily happening verbally, right? What happens when the opportunity to verbally be sexually harassing turns into the opportunity for something like sexual assault? Well, I did mention the future is now. Um, we do already see this happening in metaverse like spaces of today within the parameters that we have within the technology. This is a news article from 2018, and it talks about how a mom was horrified to see her daughter's avatar being insulted within Roblox. In the article, there's a quote that said, her child's avatar, the icon that represents here a multiplayer online game platform, who was blonde hair and wears a t-shirt, jean shorts, was being graphically assaulted by two male avatars on the playground of the game. And the child was seven, right? So this is absolutely awful. This is what we have in our metaverse life spaces of today. Now what happens when they're more immersive? when they have higher fidelity. Again, we know exactly what this is going to look like because the answer is now. Um, this is a piece from 2022 discussing how the avatar of a 21-year-old researcher was sexually assaulted in Meta's virtual reality platform, Boys and Worlds. In the article, there's a really interesting quote about the incident. It says, quote, it still counts. It has a real impact on users. And I think that's a really important point to keep in mind is that the actions in these digital spaces whether it's in Roblox, whether it's in something more immersive, they have real psychological repercussions. And there tends to be this idea that there's not that there's a delineation between digital experiences and physical experiences. And while there are, the psychological and physiological repercussions of being assaulted in a digital space is very real. It's very real. And it's something we've known for nearly two decades. Um, this is a paper from 2006. They have participants break their level of comfort in response to animate and inanimate objects in live and virtual viewing conditions, and they measured their electrodermal uh, activity. They observed significant negative reactions to violations of interpersonal space in what they called stereoscopic 3D displays, right? 
as like way beyond before, right? what we know today, right? Um, then exposed to the natural environment. It was analogous, it was synonymous. We were experiencing the same physiological responses. <clears throat> so that transition, transitions us to the next question. Why does the state of the universe matter? What's the real impact of this? Who's being impacted and how are they being impacted? First, we're gonna do the who, and then we're gonna do how. So we've already shown that the direct target is likely to be affected. Psychological repercussions are very real, they're the same, but beyond the direct target, who's really being impacted? And there's a real gap in understanding the nature, severity, and kind of radius of these behaviors beyond the direct target. This, these behaviors, this toxicity, whatever you want to call it, it harms not only the person who's directly impacted, but the broader community of witnesses. This is called the radius of impact. Um, this comes from the Fair Play Alliance. And you can see here, it's, there's a lot of them. Player communities, content moderators, game developers, game companies, teachers, caregivers, friends, family. There's a long line of direct and indirect, I don't know what that means, sorry. Um, direct and indirect um, repercussions. So this isn't just about person A doing something and person B or saying something and person B. It's about person A being a real person with feelings, right? And person B doing something awful to person A. And all these other people witnessing it. But it's not just like four people witnessing it, it's like 4,000 people witnessing it because it's happening in an open public space. The community managers are also witnesses to it because that's who they go to. And the community managers, and then they go to their friends and family. And then the community managers go to their therapists. Um, and this is the radius, right? And this is a very conservative radius because each of these circles can then circle out for just a single incident. Now, before you say Rachel, aren't you being a good to men? Um, no, I am nothing but a woman of science. Uh, and research has found both short and long term mental health repercussions to online harassment for the direct target as well as any third party home person may witness it. So that's the who. Who's being impacted? Him. Direct target, homeowners, community managers, family friends. What about the how? I'm going to focus on two hows today. How the normalization of hate and harassment, the ineffective moderation of the metaverse light spaces of today impact us both individually and societally on these two lenses, through these two lenses, both mental health and extremism and radicalization. So first mental health. Um, the mental health impact of our digital spaces does not just like magically contain itself in the four walls of our digital playgrounds. If someone says something horrible to me and I turn off and I walk away, I'm still affected by that interaction that happened. Uh, and research has found that these behaviors can and do have significant mental health impact, and I mean significant. Um, this is from the 2021 ADL report that says, how has online harassment impacted your mental health and one in 10 so they had suicidal thoughts because of their online harassment. I don't want to do it. Um, they specifically asked, how have your experiences of disruptive behaviors in online games influenced your day to day? And there was a wide range. Felt uncomfortable, was one in four, felt less social, was one in five. Taking steps to reduce my personal safety was nearly one in five. Contacted the police. One in ten had school and work negatively impacted is also one in ten. What's notable here is that these findings were both as a direct target but also a witness. So there's this whole ripple effect that we need to keep in mind. So these outcomes, as you see here, have significant consequences, both in the gaming space, you know, felt less social or felt uncomfortable, but also outside of it. We're seeing individual repercussions, but we're also seeing societal repercussions. So having work or school negatively impacted one in ten. 3 million game players, right? You think of that on the sheer scale of society, unless it becomes a societal problem. Now, touching on the ways in which these individual outcomes start to creep into societal impacts, this is a report from 2021 from the Surgeon General. It's a bit of a long quote, but I think it's important. It's on the opening page of the report, and it says, well, technology platforms have improved our lives in important ways. We know for many people that can also have adverse effects. When not deployed responsibly and safely, these tools can pit us against each other, reinforce negative behaviors like bullying and exclusion, and undermine the safety and supportive environments beyond the people we enter. So again, the individual impact on mental health and toxic spaces is a societal problem. It's contributing to broader discussions of cyberbullying and exclusion, as discussed here, and lack of what they call safe and supportive 
digital environments. And when we think about these impacts right now, we're talking about our current, again, metaverse like spaces. Bullying and exclusion is awful. It can have significant mental health impacts, as we noted in the previous slides. But we also have to remember that this is just the tip of the iceberg, because there are a lot of really bad things that happen online in the metaverse like spaces of today. What are they going to look like in the metaverse like spaces of tomorrow? There's also more societal impacts to consider, and this is in the context of extremism and radicalization. So in the metaverse like spaces of today, it refers to the leveraging of the toxic cultures for attitude and behavior change, specifically in the context of extremism and radicalization. And you may be thinking that escalated quickly. <laughs> and, and you're right, um, except not that quickly, because as I mentioned before, and I showed the data, toxicity has been embedded in gaming cultures for a significant amount of time. And this has been tied specifically and linked specifically to extremism and radicalization. So research has pointed out that participation in toxic hateful behaviors is associated with an increased risk in being persuaded by far right extremist propaganda specifically. So TLDR, being entrenched in a culture that normalizes hate increases the likelihood that you two may choose to participate in this behavior. Because when we allow hate to spread without consequence, it normalizes in all spaces. And clearly our moderation is failing us somewhere along the line because this has become normalized, as we already discussed. Now what this research was pointing out specifically uh, was that participation to toxic gamer behavior can lead you more vulnerable to more extreme forms of behavior, both in and out of game. And we know from years of psychological research that we are who our friends are, right? So like your mom's like, don't hang out with the kids smoking behind the gym, right? Because she doesn't want that peer group to influence the way you see and interact with the world. And this is the same idea, just on a much larger scale and within our digital spaces. We also know that many perpetrators of verbal violence are radicalized on the front. So this is a big, this is a big consequence if you ask me. And if you remember those prevalence graphs earlier about the normalization of hate and toxicity, this also extends to more extreme behavior. So this is some of my recent um, work that came out of our work. Uh, it's a grant project funded by the Department of Homeland Security, looking specifically at extremism in games. And again, you see direct target and witness. Direct experiences are lower on the whole than we saw before, but witnessing these actions is still more the norm than the exception for most of these extreme categories, racism, misogyny, LGBTQIA hate, and white nationalism. Anti-government and Islamism still hold strong at about one in four, 28 25%. So the sheer normalcy of these behaviors has led to the perception and honestly the reality that these spaces aren't welcoming, that they're places where hate is commonplace, being molested. Now, one of these big parts of the normalization, specifically in the context of extremism, has to do with the cultures that have developed in these metaverse like spaces. And specifically around this identity, I want to talk about of a gamer. Um, gamer is a social identity. Player is a temporary status that you have when you're functionally playing a game, but a gamer is how you identify yourself in the world. You know, you wear funny t-shirts and it's the way you decorate your office. I know there's some, there's some gamers in here. Um, it helps us identify us, ourselves in the world. I have a lot of social identities. I would say I'm a gamer even though I have small children who don't play games around. Um, but these identities are important, as I said, because they position ourselves in the world. Now, the caveat here is when it comes to gamer cultures, because of the normalization of age, they're more associated with exclusion than inclusion, which is why we have that phrase that we hear a lot called toxic, toxic gamer cultures. So over the last year, I was doing some work and collaboration with the University of Texas with Bill Swan and Alexi Martel, looking at this idea called identity fusion. So typically, we have our individual identities, and we have our group identities, and these identities are separate, as you see here. But sometimes, these identities fuse together, and they become more porous, and this is called identity fusion. And fusion is interesting because when your identities fuse, you're more willing to self-sacrifice in service of bold groups. And the best example I can give, my dad was a Marine. <laughs> Once a Marine, always a Marine. There is no teasing apart any part that is the Marine and any part that is any other part of my body, right? Now, traditionally, fusion happens because you have a deep emotional bond with the group that, that happens over a shared um, over shared experiences, over a very time, you have shared norms, you have a shared language, you're a close, tight, knit group. But these contributors, as I read over them, sounded a lot like gaming to me, shared experiences, close, tight, knit groups. So we're like, okay, let's look at fusion among gamers, knowing that the cultures are embedded in this idea of hate. So what we found is that people with fused identity 
also were more likely to score higher on measures of, it says willingness to fight or die, which is a huge measure, that's how you determine if you're or not, but narcissism, Machiavellianism, which is a personality trait associated with being deceitful, lack of morality, narcissism, psychopathy, which is measured as a lack of empathy, racism, sexism, and it says all right identity, but it should say um, espousing the beliefs associated with white nationalism, because that's what the questions were about. Interestingly, it was not associated with age, gender, or how long they had played, years maybe, but it was associated with being the time. And we also found the relationships to be significantly stronger among those who played multiplayer versus single player, to me suggesting that the relationships were stronger based on greater exposure to communities. So the longer you're immersed in a community, the greater likelihood you are to be exposed to extreme technologies, the greater likelihood you are to adopt and endorse more extreme behaviors like racism and sexism and that sort of thing. So this is a cultural impact, right? We're getting to the swastika. Um, this is a cultural impact. Having a fused identity is not doing that. Um, having a fused identity changes the way we see and interact with the world. And what makes us think this culture is going to change in any way by it just becoming more embedded and more complicated and more complex? Um, we have to think how there will absolutely be new opportunities for leveraging the spaces. One big concern is like new ways to leverage it, right? So our moderation is largely focused on text based moderation. We don't have a lot of efforts to do like moderation of objects that are created, or this is a Roblox map that's a World War II um, simulator. Like we don't have the tools already now to, to, to moderate this, like what's gonna happen when it becomes <clears throat> more immersive. Um, this kind of content exists because it's not moderation. So when we see this normalization, combined with failed moderation, this is open the door, for leveraging these identities for recruitment, the dissemination of propaganda. Um, for the future, there is a lot of talk and a genuine, genuine concern about using more immersive spaces as training grounds uh, to perpetrate violence. And it's horrifying to think about. Um, how are we going to know that these spaces are created in our metaverse that spaces? How are we going to find them? How are we going to take them down? How are we going to stop them? How are we going to see them? How are we going to watch them? Brought you down. I know. <laughs> I'm going to bring you back up. I promise. Um, in my notes, I put, now that we're all sufficiently horrified, let's talk about research challenges. If we want to improve these spaces, we're going to have to research them. If we want to research the metaverse like spaces of today and tomorrow, we have to think about the limitations. Um, you know, the first limitation is one that all the researchers in here can relate to data collection. Um, high quality data has been the greatest limitation of researchers. Um, the field of psychology, the field of game studies, and the most significant roadblock to understanding our metaverse like spaces of today, particularly when, because we're trying to combat this moral panic kind of broad stroke thinking that's really hard to get over, like the wounds of the past of it, just trying to make these spaces better. The work of researchers is very limited by our access to data. Lack of access to high quality data limits us in many ways. Um, our research design, right? We do snapshot like single, you know, kind of cross-sexual studies, participant recruitment. If I get like 250 people, I'm like super happy. That's there's three billion gamers, like that's not super great. Um, yeah, it's hard to recruit them. It's usually like a social media situation. You know, having active industry collaborators, for instance, would solve a lot of these problems. And it's something that I often soapbox about, and then to which I hear that's a you problem. We have access to all this stuff. Um, and we don't really want to work with you because academics are annoying. We have terrible time management. I don't have any money, which is hard. Also, I have great time management. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, but the collaboration, right, the subjectivity, there is really value in working together with industry partners and, and people in academia. But we're going to have to, you know, start to work together. But there have been really novel kind of movements to get past this data collection without working together. Um, the Oxford Institute, for example, has a collaboration with the ESA. They've got some, some access. We can also get creative, like Roblox, for instance, has an open API. It can make a lot you can scrape it. And I've done that in the past. I also did this work last year with um, in collaboration with a bunch of partners, but one of them was Gamer Safer. And Gamer Safer is like an air to age verification and moderation third-party platform that people can put on their private Minecraft servers. 
So they connected us with people who host private servers and got data that way. So there are some novel ways to kind of get around the data problem. Um, but honestly, I think if we're going to do anything at scale, there's going to have to be collaboration with tech. Now, the second consideration, um, shout out to Portal. We went to dinner with some students, and one of them said Portal was their favorite. So here you go. Um, it's very inspiring. Um, engaging in ineffectively moderated spaces is a risk to the user and a risk to the researcher who's researching the space. I was recently part of a Vox poll panel about researcher safety, and the concerns in the metaverse was actually the topic um, of the panel. And it was a topic that I'd never like formally really considered before, and definitely not one that I've talked about in kind of a public advocacy way, but it's one I wanted to bring up here because engaging in any kind of research, any kind of metaverse like space, I was certainly given no counsel about what I was going to encounter, what I needed to do to protect myself, what my resources were. Um, and we have these spaces of today, we're going to have these spaces of tomorrow, and it is irresponsible to send people into these spaces that don't care. So this is the, the box poll output that was kind of the central of the, of the panel. Dr. Elizabeth Pearson was one of the authors on it. Now, in this, they were talking specifically about researchers in the extremist space, but there are a lot of lessons here that can and should be generalized as a whole um, within any kind of metaverse-like space, any space where you may encounter hate, harassment, that sort of stuff, especially in a normalized situation. So what are the risks here that we need to think about, and what should we be doing about it? The first thing that researchers they interviewed expressed was explicit concern about the fact they had no idea of the risks they were getting into before they started doing it. Research in metaverse-like spaces of today and tomorrow need proper safeguarding for researchers, including information on the real harms that they could experience directly, the real harms they could witness, understanding that these effects aren't just online and not magically contained, they will impact you in all areas of your life. And this report, one in four, 26%, said they wanted explicitly written guidance on what to expect in terms of potential harms and the current support that are then available. They also noted it wasn't, this doesn't exist. Like nobody had ever seen any kind of like written guidance given to them. Um, as I said, I certainly wasn't born. I was grateful that I was more seasoned scholars than me uh, gave me some guidance and some direction when I entered the space, but it was certainly not some kind of like comprehensive informed consent. Now, the harms they talked about were threefold, external, internal, and professional. Uh, external harms are kind of like what you would expect in a space where there's harassment and they, you know, threats of physical harm, um, gender and identity-based harm, and um, online harassment, just generally. Um, as researchers, we're entering these spaces and we're poking around, even with the best of intentions to make the world a better place. Uh, these are real risks. I just read an awful Twitter thread this morning, actually, about someone who's being chronically swatted, um, like chronically, and there's little to do about it. Internal harms are kind of the repercussions of the external harms, isolation and withdrawal, uh, emotional issues that can go over time, um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder symptomology is a long term debilitating repercussions you experience. Um, and then to help combined, they led to professional harms, which were identified as the report yeah, being um, caused by the other two. So it's an effective online harassment. It silences the researchers. It can have negative impact on group progression. The desire to avoid public abuse. They don't do talks like this. They don't want to publish their work with their own name. They don't want to do interviews because they don't want more, more of this. And it leads to a lack of visibility. It typically impacts the lowest in power, the PhD students, the early career researchers. So I think one of the big takeaways from here, again, is to remember that online and offline is a false dichotomy. And what we experience in these, in these spaces are very real and they impact every aspect of our lives. And when we study or when we research these spaces, it doesn't happen in a vacuum apart from our professional and personal lives. The second thing was boundary setting. Boundary setting is difficult, um, especially when it comes to metaverse-like spaces if we're talking about them as games, because most of us in this field went into this field because we have a love for interacting with them. Like, so what's working, what isn't? As much as I like to think playing the Witcher 3's work. Maybe, never. Um, boundary setting is difficult to navigate, even in the best of times, especially for early career researchers. And it's about setting boundaries in the physical space. Prepare them. 
do you have a separate room that you go to? This was a big issue in COVID times. I feel like it really actually brought up this point. Like your desk shouldn't be next to your bed. It should be somewhere else. Where you have to have these physical boundaries. It's about digital boundaries as well, though. How do you protect your personal identity? How do you make sure you're not giving away personal information? How do you scrape your information from the internet so people can't find you? These sorts of things. So it's technical boundaries, but also physical boundaries. And also mental boundaries. One suggestion um, was setting timers, like especially for the extremism and terrorism stuff, if you're looking at really kind of awful content, set a timer so you're not being able to fall down the rabbit hole and get stuck in forever. All of these points tie into the need for a great need for institutionalized support including responding to harms when they happen. A lot of people said they would go to their institution and say, harm has occurred, and they'd be like, I don't know what to do with you, because <laughs> it's online and it's not the same, and we don't have protocols, we don't know what to do. 31% uh, of this report said they wanted a formalized network of how to get support from their institution, but they also wanted informal networks of support, which is what I found in my work, informal networks like on WhatsApp groups and that sort of thing. The report also noted that, quote, institutions frequently fail to regard online spaces as a valid research location for meaningful research and protection. So, as I hope I have demonstrated here, online harms are offline harms, online harms are real and important and vital, um, and we need formalized support for the people who are studying these spaces up to date and So, this is what the problems are. We know we have to fix them. We have to address them and to start expanding on them before we get to Ready Player One. So what do we do? Do we burn it? Are we doomed to failure? I like to be not. Um, I like to be a bit more hopeful. So I'm going to end today with some tangible ideas. Just spit it all in here. Uh, I'll see what sticks. About how to just improve our present. Because if we can improve our present, we're in a better position to improve our future. Um, advice number one is changing the environment. Changing the environment of the metaverse like spaces we have today, um, through better moderation. Even if we didn't improve a single moderation tool, can we at least like be transparent about what we're actually doing in there? Nobody even really told you what they're doing. Um, Xbox released its first transparency report ever this year, which is a great step. Um, but like they're the only ones who've done it. And also it's not like super clear. I mean it's better than nothing, but it's not like the best transparency report I've ever seen. Um, to understand, you know, what's happening, what's being reported, what's being actioned, what strategies are you using that are proactive instead of reactive? How can we learn from it? How can we all do it? Because so we're all on the same page. We all need to be on the same page. Um, I also talk about community management, which I think is a really important, um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You know, they, they shape the community. A lot of people think of community management as people just like ban the trolls. But like, if we're just playing black and white, like, you're never going to win that game. Um, so I'd like to have more discussions about the role of community management, how they're shaping the norms, how they're a pivotal part of actually this culture change if we want to actually shift the culture that's happening in these spaces. In the work I mentioned earlier that we did on Minecraft, we actually found that community management strategies, the rules that they set and the amount of moderators they had to kind of enforce the rules was a much greater predictor of how toxic the environment was as compared to just bans. So it really is about kind of shaping the community and what's expected and what's normalized versus just like whack them all in the bad guys. And then lastly, institutionalized support, as I mentioned, about changing the research environment. Um, we need institutionalized support. We are failing students if we are not doing this for them. We truly are. The second is advocacy and outreach. One aspect is parental education. Again, with moderation and CMs, like we can try and fix the problems of tomorrow, but how will we fix the problems of today? And I cannot understate the amount of conversations I have where it's like, I know my son's on Discord. Cool. With who? Um, okay. How many people are there? Right? Um, we have to have some kind of education that gets passed down to the future generation. Um, and, and more proactive advocacy about what's acceptable, what's not, who they talk about, what are they doing, what do they do when they encounter swastikas in their Roblox map? Do they even know what to do? Do they even know if that's normalized, or if that's an acceptable part of culture? Do they know it's not? Do parents even know they're encountering it? Yeah? And you think about cyberbullying, which I think is a good um, analogy, because I think it took a long time, actually, for parents to get on board to understand the severity of cyberbullying. And like we have to make that whole jump again to think about the more broader um, effects and experiences and repercussions that are happening. 
in these spaces. Um, also, again, education advocacy outreach on behalf of the researchers. We need to advocate for them. Um, and then, you know, data access and transparency. Data, at least for me, is always a problem. You know, self-regulation and self-policing may not work in a place where there's a direct conflict of interest. So it makes sense that the industry may not want to jump on board with research that's going to publicly be like, here's some problems. Um, but we've got to start working together. We just have to. Um, I mentioned earlier that with Minecraft. We found a whole lot of stuff there about CMs and about moderation strategies. And what was really great about that is that we just like released it into the world, right? And everyone could have it. From Indies to AAAs, everybody had the same information. So even if you don't want to work with us, you know, I think the industry should, just some transparency about what they're doing and their strategies. I digress. So keep where we are. Just going to have the same results that we have now. Spaces that can be fun, spaces where there's a lot of problems, spaces that are causing problems, individual and societal problems on a large scale. And I know there's always going to be bad actors on the internet. There are metaverse spaces like of today, and there are metaverse spaces of tomorrow. You know, severe negative mental health repercussions are happening to the targets, to the witnesses. We're trying to make these spaces better, but we're also at risk of being targets, the witnesses, lots of awful things. But I think if we all band together, here's our kumbaya moment, if we all band together. Um, I do think there is hope to change the culture and change the shift before full Ready Player One becomes more ubiquitous and more affordable and more everywhere, um, more magnified. So, hopeful. Didn't feel as hopeful as I thought it would. I promise it is hopeful. Um, but thank you for, for having me, and I do have some time for questions. So we do have about 10 minutes for any questions, and I will go ahead and pass the mic back in. Hi. Um, I just had a question. You talked a little bit about parent education. I have a brother who's 11, and my parents um, have no idea what to do with him. So I didn't know if you had any recommendations of things that I could tell them about now, because he's just starting to really enter these spaces. Yeah, great question. I have my oldest is eight, so it's not quite eleven. We don't have any strategies. Uh, one is to talk to them, like super casually, like what are you playing? Who are you with? What do you like about it? What are you doing in there? And see if anything seems off about what they're saying. Especially like eleven, I would love a pretty good talk to them about who is actually with you with. Very dangerous thing in digital spaces. Um, and I would start with it. It's about having open dialogue. And about having an eye on what's actually happening and not letting them kind of like run wild and pretend like we want to work less with the internet because it is not moderated well. So we cannot trust the space to contain it and be safe. Hi. Um, how much do you think that the last, in the last, within the last few decades primarily, the polarization of like politics and different uh, just like modern civil you know just focuses have been impacting this gaming like the gaming spaces in terms of like what people are saying and how people are saying it. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, I think that our digital spaces are a reflection of culture, but they also create culture. So I think it's definitely the two ways that it has absolutely impacted. Why do I still have the last few days? Polarization, right? And it's not impacted culture that makes things. So I would say it has impacted it, but it's also deep-rooted in the city of Sorry. Um, do you think that, like, when you, where do you think that this started? Do you think it started with the lack of moderation in internet spaces as we had in season laptops? Or do you think this is something that has more picked up now rather than then? I think it's always been there. I think it is more visible now because more people are in these digital spaces now, and I think more people feel much more comfortable in discussing the more rights of the So I wanted to go off uh, towards the end of your 
presentation, you're talking about the importance of education. Um, and one of the things I thought about when you were talking about that idea is how do we get information out and educate people? Because one of my frustrations being an academic is that our information doesn't get out to the public, right? It's in our great journals, but they don't read our journals. And often the other side of that is that media pays attention to the sensationalized pieces, right? Because good evenings cause violence. No, they don't. Right. <laughs> but we just had an hour. Point, with that last question, there's also an increased distrust of media, which is one of the only outlets we have to educate them. Yeah. So the idea is not to be working with like the balance we want to So what do you think the prevalence of social media as a whole uh, and the kind of evidence that we've seen of racially motivated attacks and things like that that has been blown up and exacerbated by social media and in turn in gaming communities? How do you think that correlates? Yeah, they're definitely related. And you see a lot of social media. The thing about social media is they're 20 years ahead of games in terms of how racist And there's only like this so I guess I'll have the privilege of asking the last question. Then. So you've talked a lot about the negative components in terms of Roblox. You've talked about it that you see sometimes in some of the other games. But let's talk about a more positive aspect, and let's talk about Animal Crossing, which you love your comments. I have a few minutes. I can kind of suspend. So, if you're saying that those negative components are what is leading to this polarization, what can we learn from games like Animal Crossing and others that are pro social that don't have the negative elements that you were describing for the course of this presentation? Yeah. Let me say, games are overwhelmingly more positive than negative. Our metaverse communities say are overwhelmingly more positive than negative. Unless they're like that really sort of negative thing, what does it mean? Games are overwhelmingly more positive than negative. Um, the things I see, games promote social learning. Games can be great for bringing people together. I grew up in a small town in Texas. If there was any other girl who liked video games in my town, I was not. I wish I had the internet of today that I had back then. So social connection, reduction in loneliness, it's linked to increased creativity. Um, they can be great spaces for stress relief and mood management. You know, you have a bad day, you log into Animal Crossing, you tend to your farm, um, and you have a better mood. It moves your mood into something more positive. Um, so games are actually really great, great tools, even the ones with the social components. It's just the bad is the loudest group, as always, the dissenters are the loudest. And they have shifted the culture of the space that's made it awful to me. Like, I would never, I don't want to say it, I'm on the screen. There are certain games we would never play because of their reputation for their social media. Right? So we have to kind of move the positive into all the spaces and make that last. So with that being said, that is a great place to offer tonight. Let's once again, please give Rachel a round of now, I do have one more thank you to uh, Dean Janet for 
on David from the School of Business as he was able to give us the technical support to actually have the microphones that we can hear. So there will be a lovely reception outside. So thank you for coming and have a good night.